There you are, Gregory. All right. All right. Sorry about that. That was Twitter, uh, the Twitter matrix uh, rearing its ugly head again, I think. Um, anyhow, <laughs> we're, we're both here. The only thing is Steve, I see him out there in the Twitterverse, uh, but he is, <laughs> he's, I think he's in limbo also. So Steve, just confirming, blink twice if you can hear me. Uh, but if you can, <laughs> please uh, make sure you're on your mobile phone. And when you are... Um, Go ahead and uh, you should get in uh, or you can hit request. He just, he, he just left. So, okay, um, okay, good. All right. So why don't we talk more important stuff? Uh, we are a few minutes in. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This is the Regenerati News Hour. Uh, pardon the technical difficulties. I blame Elon. Uh, but uh, we have a great show today with um, Steve Zwick. Uh, from Vera, who is going to be joining us to talk about the um, the Guardian article, which created a number of waves, the good, the, good, the bad, the ugly of that uh, particular article, um, what under, uh, was underlying it, the kind of the backstory. Um, and I think, you know, pr- frankly, just as important, get into kind of where next, what's moving. Um, and, uh, you know, Steve's been very generous with his time and helping uh, com- uh, share with both Gregory and myself, uh, uh, kind of what's been happening uh, since that article. So I'm looking forward to digging in. And, and frankly, there's uh, far bigger topics uh, than that Guardian article to explore with Steve as soon as he joins us again. So, uh, Gregory, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, we can banter here uh, for if you want to pick off anything or uh, onboard any concepts before Steve uh, joins. Please feel free. Awesome. Well, yeah, excited. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, <laughs> super annoying. Um, so, well, so as usual, I'll start with just a, a brief little uh, report back from the Berkshire Sweet Gold Maple Farm here. Um, we got uh, about four inches of snow last night, and it's nice and cold for the next few days. So we're um, the sap is not flowing. We're not getting a nice break. Um, we've boiled about almost 400 gallons of syrup which is pretty exciting Um, and it's all been amazingly light for those of you who sometimes hear me report on the maple farm in the beginning of the regenerati news hour um, just as a little grounding exercise to the you know (laughs) real world farming activities Um, the the sap when it flows earlier in the year um, is more likely to, um, at the end of the boil, be this amazing, very light, um, almost it's it's like um, like olive oil. It's very, very light, light amber. So that's what's been coming out. It's really delicious. So yeah, it's, it's exciting, exciting stuff. Um, and I'm very excited about this conversation with Steve. I had the pleasure to get to jam with him a little bit yesterday, as well as uh, he and I were on a panel in Davos together. Um, and, you know, Steve's been around the carbon space for a long time. He was the managing editor at um, Carbon Pulse, and he was involved in uh, forest trends for a long time, for a decade. Um, he also has experience as a commodities broker and, uh, and, and a journalist. And um, yeah, just really interesting <clears throat> to chat. And so I think the conversation that we're going to have, and, and we're going to probably, you know, maybe we can get, get some folks up here and, and jam a little bit if, if we're still um, having trouble with Steve. But um, you know, sort of assuming that Steve hops on, the run of play here is going to be Steve and I are going to dialogue for, you know, probably 30 minutes or so. And then uh, we'll open it up for uh, questions and and dialogue. We're going to be real, um, you know, part of this is creating a, a space for, you know, Steve to tell his side of the story. So, um, you know, no adversarial or trolling, please. Um, and the the general conversation that I want to have with Steve is kind of about um, just digging in. Hey, Steve, it looks like you're back. Hopefully um, we'll get you on. Awesome. Welcome. Can you hear me? 
Steve, you're muted. Uh, so if you hit the uh, little bottom left button, you should be able to speak. You're muted right now. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. There you go. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. I, there... I didn't realize I had to be on my cell phone, so I had to run upstairs, get the phone, install the app. Nah, you're all it's good. happened you're all it's Welcome, happened Steve. to the best of us that's happened to me several times um well steve excited to have you i was just about to give everybody kind of the run of play so um some of the conversations that uh that you and i were were chatting about and, and kind of digging into a little bit yesterday as we were kind of pre-gaming um so just to kind of throw out a few of the the, the topics of discussion and then you can add anything that you want to just kind of like round out what we what we're going to be covering and dialoguing about and mm -hmm. then we can just dig in um so you know some of the things that i'm most interested in is just kind of um unpacking the process of um governance and decision making around these complex issues like what is the baseline that is specific that is operational at any given time and understanding mm -hmm. that, the dynamics of that, where it can be upgraded. I'm super interested in that. Um, so that's one of the things that we were chat, starting to chat about a little yesterday. And I think it'd be super interesting for everybody to be able to hear. Um, I'm also, of course, want to give you an opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about what was sort of wrong and maybe even disingenuous around the recent reporting and articles that were sort of, uh, you know, or hit pieces that recently came out. Uh -huh. And um, and maybe also, if you don't mind, giving people your honest opinion about where Vera, but maybe the larger industry at large, you know, where where improvements are actively being made, and and you know, which of those are the most important? Like, what should we really, you know, if if folks are getting it wrong with their kind of like hot takes, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of undermining things. What are they not seeing that we really could be improving on as an industry? That's another, I think, really fruitful conversation. And um, do you have anything that you want to add to that? That's kind of my, you know, uh, morning recollection of our of, of where we were at yesterday. But uh, what else do you want to cover? No, I think those are the three main issues that we discussed. I think the first and the third are really related to each other. I can, so I think I'll, I'll take those as a single question. And, and then, and maybe just talk about it at a high level. And then if you think, if you have follow ups, so just kind of do it off the top of my head. And if, if you think I'm skipping around too much or something, just ask me to drill down. And then I think answering that will then lead to, uh, the, the second question, because I think there's a lot of things, there's a lot of developments that have been ongoing and that are kind of baked into the creation of the standard from the day it was launched. And that those, um, I think the, you know, it's not just the Guardian, but the site, they, they, they missed, you know, they, they, they ignored, I, I'd actually argue because we, we told them that. <laughs> and, um, and then that's the only ones. I think there's, so I think that, I think that the, the main thing is to look at how, how the whole process of creating baselines, you know, how, you know, how it's conceived, how, how it's done how it's evolved so far, how it's continuing to evolve and, and then, you know, what the reasoning behind that is. And then, and then get into what, what a lot of people are missing. Some people I think are missing it intentionally. Some people are just missing it because it's complicated. And, and to be fair, none of the standards Vera included have really done a, a good job of communicating this until recently. It was a bunch of scientists sitting around talking to other scientists, people like you who, who know the space, and uh, up until, I mean, I, I only joined, I switched from being a reporter to being a um, communications guy just last year. And I joined here explicitly because I realized they hadn't, you know, they, they, they were, they hadn't, they hadn't taken the time to explain this, this stuff properly. And a lot of people were suddenly, you know, people who couldn't be bothered to think about climate change four years ago were suddenly popping in and demanding instant solutions a really complex problem. So it's it, there is a communications issue there too. So maybe I, if I haven't rambled too much, I can start by just addressing the first and third questions as if it was one question. And then yeah, we can go from no, that, that sounds okay. great. That sounds great. And let me just interject and level set for a brief moment. And and please just um, 
upgrade anything that I say that is wrong. But so mm -hmm. when we're referring to baseline, basically in, in the process of baselining, what's being discussed is um, the approach to measure how a specific carbon project is performing relative to the larger landscape. And this mm -hmm. is particularly important when we're talking about avoided deforestation, for instance, or conservation projects, which should be essentially preserving intact forest at a, at a better rate, at a higher degree of performance than the larger landscape that isn't participating in the program. And that's how we do the carbon accounting that then turns into a carbon credit, correct? That's, that's basically correct. I think it's, it might be a little more, just a, a little more nuanced to say it, uh, you know, how does it respond, you know, how does it perform compared to business as usual? Because quite often the projects that are implemented will change business as usual. And in the process of doing that, they, they'll actually alter the surrounding territory through positive externalities. So that does become, um, you know, that, that, that becomes a, uh, a factor when you start to try to evaluate baselines retroactively. But generally speaking, I think that's right. Going forward, the idea is what, you know, it's like if you, because I think the way you're describing it is the way when we look at synthetic controls, that's what's, in, what's baked into that. And that actually is, is the way baselines are evaluated and adjusted over time. So it's, it's accurate, but I think it's, it's more, it's more just, you know, how do you, um, you know, how, how does it perform? But what would it, you know, how, how does it perform relative to a business as usual? scenario is, is the way we, we tend to state it. Right, which is a little complex, right? And, and so there's probably room, and, and I know there is active sort of dialogue and even disagreement among mm -hmm. th that's in earnest about how do we get the best possible baseline? How do we approach this in a way that generates um, the, the legitimacy and authenticity of, of the claim and therefore the credit? Um, and it's, you know, this recent spat of articles, you know, really what's going on is they're basically saying like, oh, this entire way of doing things is, <laughs> is bad. And they knew it and, and Barron knew it was bad and the project developers knew it was bad. And therefore, they're sort of saying this is moving, even moving towards fraud. Right. And, and making a big <laughs> deal. And that's getting lots of headlines. And I think so I'd love for you to just speak directly to, to the ways in which and and. And uncovering the, because this is really the entree into like learning about what's the actual process for the baseline. You know, the, when do they get updated? Mm -hmm. How does that update happen? And, you know, like what's the relationship between the market actors, the buyers and the verifiers in that sort of core process of baselining that completely, you know, none of that information showed up, obviously, in the articles. Right, right. Yeah, and it, and it's central to everything that they do. I mean, this you can, I mean, if you look at the way baselines are created, it, it it didn't just pop up in 2010 when Vera approved the first Red Plus methodology. It goes back to the late 70s, early 80s when you started seeing research into what drives deforestation and how do you model it. People like Sandra Brown and uh, um, oh god, I'm drawing blanks on some. There are a lot of a, a cluster of scientists were doing a lot of work into modeling the drivers of deforestation locally um you know and unfortunately we lost two of the pioneers just in the in the past, past couple of years sandra brown and uh nor norman i'm drawing a blank anyway um the the it, it was pretty clear if you if you going back even into the 80s you could look and see okay if you want to model if you want to look at what's happening where, where deforestation is going to happen you can look and you can see what's causing it you can see incursions of small holders into areas where their mosaic deforestation is taking place. You can see where they're coming from, where they're going, where similar areas of deforestation exist, where you have the same landscape, the same regulatory apparatus, the same economic drivers and everything. And you could predict pretty accurately what was going to happen over the next five or six years. That, that, that has been constant going back to the eighties. And over time, we start, you know, the, the first red, Plus projects were initiated in the late 80s, early 90s, and they used very rudimentary modeling to try and identify where deforestation was taking place, what intervent, what changes in human activities can be implemented to prevent that. So you had throughout the throughout the 90s and the early 2000s, you had extensive 
trial and error to see what works, what doesn't, why, what interventions, and you know, bring the best results. And the, for the most part, most deforestation, when you're talking about unplanned deforestation as opposed to planned deforestation, it usually is driven by smallholders and poverty. And so the, the solutions tend to be bringing in alternative livelihoods and things like that, that that help to take the pressure off the forest. And the way baselines were created was using very well established, I mean, this all comes out of environmental impact analysis. These are the same tools that governments use to determine policy, uh, you know, geomod modeling modeling programs where you, you can you can punch in, you know, the, the the local actors of deforestation, be it miners or whatever, you can punch in the landscape, you can punch in all the different variables. And you would look for an area that's already experienced deforestation. And you would say, okay, this area, this area has, has already experienced deforestation. Here you've got an area that has not yet experienced it, but it's the same exact situation. How do we prevent what happened here from happening there? And you use what happened in the first place as a reference area. And you say, now we've got this reference area. We think this is going to be the deforestation that happens in, in the project area over the next 10 years or over the next 30 years, maybe with, if we don't have some kind of an intervention and then you establish the baseline based on that. The way that the way the system was implemented was designed to work is you would come up with a, you know a project proponent would come up with a scenario, present it to a VVB, which is an independent verification body recognized under one of one of one of you know, either a federal government or a the UNFCCC or or other agencies, and then further verified certified by Vera to say okay we we'll take this scenario that you put out we'll look at it we'll see if it makes sense. We'll put it out for public comment. Anyone who wants to can shoot holes in it and say, oh, they got this, this wrong, this wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So once you, that's the first process is coming up with the baseline and a plan for addressing it. Once that that's approved, then you go into the verification phase, which is saying, are they actually doing the work that they do? And then the, when, so when, when, when the, when the program was initiated, the idea was all baselines will be reevaluate, reassessed after 10 years. If you have a 30 year project, you're going to start out with all this modeling and, and everything based on, you know, but because everything goes through public consultation, expert review, the idea was we're going to have the latest available science at the time, but over time, we're going to continually, after 10 years, we reassess the baseline, all assumptions are reassessed and everything else. And, um, and then if, if, if we find out that maybe the baseline is, was too, too generous, we will assess it downward. Maybe if it was too strict, we, we relax it a bit and and then change it over the next 10 year period well what's happened since then there's been extensive modeling over the past well i mean most of these projects are just now coming up for reassessment so they're going in and they're looking to see which ones you know which which, which need to be assessed downwards which need to stay the same which need to be assessed upwards and in, in the in, in the intervening 10 years we've had huge advances in um in remote sensing artificial intelligence dynamic modeling, there's been, there's been a lot of, so many changes in the last 10 years, as well as the, the advent of the Paris Agreement that, that uh, we've already, Vera already implemented changes in 2021, saying that baseline, the period of, during which, you know, the, between which, between reassessments went from five, from 10 years down to six years. So at this point already, baselines are going to be reassessed every six years. And one reason for that was when they started to look just in real time at projections uh, and, and, and results, they found this usually about four to six years is where it is, is within that period, the projections are pretty accurate. After six years, things just kind of, it's just hard to predict. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen. Regimes change, as we saw in Zimbabwe. Uh, new, new science comes along. You you get uh, you know new, new gold is discovered in an area where previously there don't there'd only been timber. So the, the the new the new process is to go instead of reassessing baselines every ten years, reassess every six years. And the reason they went with six years instead of four years is because in the process of going through uh, review, you know the public consultations, way too many people said, you know what, if you go for four years, no one's going to commit capital. You need to have a period of time that's long enough for people to commit capital and come in with an honest effort to say, we're going to implement A, B, C, D, and E. And then at the end of six years, we'll, we'll reassess it again 
And if, if, if we have to change at that point, we will. But th that in a nutshell is how it works. And the way, and the way the one way the reassessments are done is, is even before looking at all of the, uh, before looking at, before, before reevaluating the basic assumptions, the simple, the simplest thing is to look at what's happened inside and outside a project area. Projects are verified every couple of years where they go through and they do meticulous analyses of are the project proponents doing everything they said they would do? Are they implementing all these activities? What is the deforestation inside the project area? What are they doing that they can control? Are they, are they doing all that right? In the reassessment, the first thing they look at is what happened outside the project area. And so if you look outside the project area and you see that, oh, wow, you know, this happened recently in Zimbabwe with uh, a project that's getting, I think, unjustly pilloried because a very good project that uh, was implemented when Mugabe was still in, in, in office. Uh, he passed away and his policies, you know, he had a policy, he had a policy of aggressive settlement in rural areas. And that, that policy continued after he died, but it, it eventually changed. And as a result, in the later years of the first 10 year period, they started to see that, um, deforestation outside the project area had slowed. So that project is now going through a reassessment and will have its baseline assessed downwards. Others are finding that the, that the, the, uh, the deforestation in the reference region and the surrounding areas actually increased. So it's, uh, and they will probably have to have the baseline adjusted upwards. So you're, you're going to see this, this kind of these readjustments where you're not going to get you're not going to get it 100 percent, but you're going if you got a 30 year project and it's reassessed every six years, then you're going to have five reassessments over over 30 years. And sometimes you get a little over, sometimes you get a little under. But the idea is, in the end, it, it uh, it'll it'll balance out. I think the term that people are using now is false positive, false negative. And you just the, the objective is to make sure those, those balance out. So I hope did that was that a, did I answer that? Yeah, well, so so a couple sort of things emerged for me as I'm listening to you talk that I think would be really interesting to to dig into are, you know, specifically who participates in decision making around baseline adjustments. What institutions or individuals are involved in that specific or project developers? Like, what's the, you know, who who's really involved in that decision at the moment? Okay, at the moment it's. It's a combination of VERA and, and, and an independent VVD, verification and validation body, like a TUFSUD or, you know, uh, DNV or somebody like that in you know, these groups that often the same people that do, do environmental impact assessments around the world and public consultation. So that those are the three components, especially if there's a CCB component, you know, community carbon and biodiversity component where, where, where you have so many social elements involved that a public consultation becomes really important. Going forward, Vera has actually has implemented a, a huge change on the Red Plus front, and this gets a little bit confusing too. I think what you know when when you look at Red Plus as envisioned, we've always had this this thing that you know to really address deforestation, you have to go at at the jurisdictional level. You can't just say, we're going to do this little patch or this little patch, this hot spot, that hot spot. Um, you know, you have to have a more comprehensive approach because if you, you, you really need to have government involvement. Uh, an example of a project that went sideways because of the lack of government support was the Sudri project in Brazil, which was an indigenous territory that was, that uh, led, created the first indigenous led Red Plus project and um, as deforestation began to rise after a few years, there was a lot of collusion with, with local, uh, local timber mills. And the indigenous people went to the governor of Mato Grosso and said, hey, we really need your help. And the governor said, hey, it's not our thing. It's a tribal thing. So it, and, and the project ended up faltering partly because of increased deforestation resulting from increased timber demand and lack of government support. But then the real killer on that was that they found diamonds and gold, which just ramped up the, ramped up the, the pressures tremendously. So it, it, the, the objective has always been to do jurisdictional crediting. And the reason that's important, you know, because most of the voluntary projects are 
standalone projects where you go in and you, you have very specific drives, drivers of deforestation in a very targeted area and you can quantify it, you can clearly map it out. In a, in a, in a jurisdiction, you're trying to get a lot of different actors working together. So and under the Paris Agreement, every, every country has, that wants Red Plus finance through jurisdictional initiatives under, under the Paris Agreement has to create what's called a FREL, Forest Reference Emission Level which is essentially their estimate of, what, of what's going to happen at deforestation at the macro level, which is easier to estimate. This is, you know, if you're looking at regional things, it's, it's, it's much more, compl you know, you're looking at site-specific drivers, so spe spe um, specific actors, specific movers, specific terrain and stuff like that. But if you're looking at an entire country, usually you take the average rate of deforestation. It just doesn't turn on a dime at the large scale. So that becomes the national level. And then you have to take, it, with, with, and the objective now is to go into, and, and payments are made by beating, you know, beating that by changing the frel, taking the frel, turning it into a baseline, which is a, a couple steps beyond what, what's done under the FCCC, and then breaking, then identifying high risk areas within that where you want to have hotspots, where, where you see a hotspot, and then maybe if the government wants to, having a project operate in that area. And what this means is you have to break the entire country down by, by, by levels of deforestation risk. So it's a slightly different shift into, into saying, um, you know, in, into looking at locally, into looking at using geospatial modeling, what sorts of drivers are indicated that this is a high risk area. And then within the high risk area saying what specific activities are most at risk. So the the reason this this looks like I'm not going to answer your question, but the way I'm I'm looping into it is going forward, Vera a, a, and designated bodies are going to have a a, a uh, more of a more of a role in defining the risk, the forest risk in a specific region than than is currently done. So so you'll have you'll have risk defined across an area, and then you will have Within that, you'll have individual projects, but the baselines will be set in a in a more standardized way than they currently are, based on based on based on broader, you know, based on specific drivers within a jurisdiction, but in a way that's standardized across the entire territory. If that makes sense. Um, so so that's the future. But the way it is now is when a baseline is reassessed, it is still done the way it had done been done before, which is that the, the, the project proponent comes up with a, you know, says, identifies what they see as the threats. A VDB then has to go through, answer that point by point. I mean, it's a very deep, I mean, these reviews take months right now. They take, the, you know, because of the VVV, but the VVB will assess it, go through point by point, do cited, go interview people on, on the ground, submit a report to Vera. Vera then will take that, review it, maybe send it back. It can go through like three rounds before it's either accepted or rejected. Um, and then, and then once, once that agreement is reached, then you have the baseline for the next, for the next period. Uh, did that, ex did that explain it right? Or did I bounce around too much there by going from, by going from the present to the future and back again? Yeah. Well, I, I think I'm kind of holding an image of that in my mind and I, I'm not as clear about, well, so, so I, I guess, it brings up two questions for me. Um, the, the first, I'll sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll set the question up a little bit um, mm -hmm. and, then, and then ask it. So what a buyer is wanting, what a corporation is wanting from a carbon credit mm -hmm. is certainty that mm -hmm. there's a unit of carbon um, that they can count against their carbon liabilities, their, their um, un, un um, unavoided emissions. Mm -hmm. um, and the way of generating that currently is sort of this social and scientific process of generating both a baseline and then of ongoing monitoring and adaptation of that. But then there's also this, and, and this wasn't at all in any of the reporting, um, and we didn't talk about this, so feel free to punt on this. But there's this, there's a, another element in the way that uh, crediting takes place, which is the buffer pool. 
mm-hmm. which, yeah. which sets aside credits knowing that there's uncertainty in order to ensure that that buyer is basically whole, that they're able mm-hmm. to like feel safe given, given that there's a lot of uncertainty in all of this. And that's what's coming through is that, okay, we have a complex social process and we have a complex scientific process and it's ongoing. And there's always some amount of uncertainty related to all of that. And these processes are meant to both minimize the uncertainty, but also when uncertainty still exists, sort of like make people whole through the buffer pool process. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just so do you want to just talk a little bit about if even if the worst case scenario happened and the baselines were were inaccurate for some reason or off statistically, et cetera, like if, if there's all of these processes, um, to what degree does the do does the buffer pool process inside of the larger kind of, um, you know, carbon credit as an instrument in the voluntary carbon market um, mm-hmm. ensure that it is kind of a commodity? ensure that like Mm -hmm. that unit of carbon is a unit of carbon and they bought it and they can make that claim without getting undermined even if there's a little bit of um you know even if it kind of all shakes out um and things baselines have to be adjusted downward and downward you know and and to what degree like yeah i guess my question is to what degree does that work and kind of cover cover these edge cases um Mm -hmm. and to what degree are we bumping up against that as an edge um and and kind of like to what degree does it matter moving forward because there's this big transformation to jurisdictional Mm -hmm. accounting and more and more sophistication more and more certainty and more and more tools around governance yeah um i guess the first thing on that the the uncertainty isn't as much addressed through the buffer pool as it is addressed through the the emphasis on conservative estimates. So anytime you know anytime there is uncertainty, they have to make the most conservative estimate. You know, they, they, they have to, just kind of like what they did with you know the projections on on, the, on on climate change itself. You know, they scientists went with the most conservative estimates. Now we find out, oh my God, they actually were too conservative. Um, and that's that's the principle that that these projects work on is be as conservative as possible whenever there whenever there is uncertainty or doubt and don't take any don't 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 include anything such as positive externality. So if there is, what I mentioned before, if there is a a positive externality such as a reduction in deforestation in the surrounding area, that that they get no credit for that. And there are tons and tons of positive externalities. The buffer pool is technically more for reversals and things like that. It's a, if, if a project has a fire or, or some, something happens that, where credits are issued and then something is reversed, do they, what, what do they do about that? So Reversal or are, project failure, right? I guess I'm missing it. Miss it you're right. Yeah. Like uncertainty versus risks of like, yeah. oh, we actually had an incursion and we weren't able right. to keep this deforestation from taking place, et right. cetera. Right. Yeah, or project failure. That's another one. If uh, if a project goes five years without a without a, a re-ver- re-verification, um, I forget the exact numbers, but they have a there's a three-step process where if a project doesn't get re-verified, uh, 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 because first of all, it emphasizes the global buffer pool. So if a project puts, you know, usually it's up to about thirty percent right now. It'll probably be higher because of increased fire risk. But if a project puts 30% of its credits into the global buffer pool, that means it's generated those credits, but it doesn't sell them. It goes into the pool. And then if, if at some point 50% of the project goes up in smoke, then the credit, the, that 30%, an, a, an equal number of credits are retired from the buffer pool and then plus additional credits to make up for the overage. So if, if a, um, if a project goes, this, I'm, I, I, I think this is the way it works, but double check. I think it's it's after if a project goes five years without a re-verification, a certain percentage of those credits are retired. I think it's the I think the the, the total number that they put into the buffer pool are are then they're are canceled is the term they use. So thirty percent will just disappear. If it goes another five years, then an, an amount equal to half of what they created, what they what they sold 
is, is canceled. And if it goes 15 years, all the credits that were sold are, uh, you know, are, are uh, canceled out. So there, so there which is would mean I, that, that which would mean that the buyer of those mm -hmm. credits, even if they retired, it's like that retirement would be nullified in, in essence. It would sort of be saying like, hey, mm -hmm. actually, you know, sorry, but you can't no, really no, no. count this against your... No, uh, no, 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 yes. no, no, no. It, because because it, it means that... Because this is the thing, that the credits are, are decoupled from the project once they're sold. So the, the, it, the, the buyer should, should think of those credits as being purchased from a system. It's almost like, you know, it's kind of like you buy a bag of... Uh, a 10-pound bag, bag of potatoes. Are you getting 10 potatoes and one pound each? Or are you getting... Are some of them bigger and some of them smaller? You know, you're, 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 uh, you're not, you're, you're, you can't really say every single ton is a ton, but you can say if you buy a hundred tons from this system, you, you've, you're, you've, you've had this environmental integrity. So if, if like the, the credits are, because remember all these credits are going into the buffer pool. And if, if a, if, if a buyer has purchased those credits and, and then, um, the project itself fails, they are still, uh, you know, th they're backed by the buffer pool. So the environmental integrity is still there. The, the net impact is still there. You, you know, does that make sense the way I'm, I'm phrasing that? Or yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, so no, that's a, that, that's the whole thing. The buyers need to know that that you know they're they're taking the you know that that they're um, that that they're they're being assured that they're not even if the, the an individual project has a reversal, it's covered by the buffer pool. Or if the project itself fails, it's covered by the buffer pool. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's um, <clears throat> so. But but what I'm hearing is that you know, and I'm curious. This is just like on the fly to hear your thoughts. Mm -hmm. When when might it make sense to actually also have to add to the buffer pool for reasons of uncertainty, right? Um, mm -hmm. instead of simply making conservative estimates. Um, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts about that. Yeah, that's, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> I, mean, right, I just joined here last year, so that, that, that is something I just don't... I wish I had a, know the answer to it. I've heard talk about that, but I think generally speaking, the, you know, the, uh, what, what they have... And this is just when I talk about you know, theoretically what to do on this type of stuff is, if you, is using the buffer pool or using a, a, cause usually a project proponent will have multiple projects. And if they find that one project is too high, one's too low, maybe making adjustments within their account so that they can, you know, they, they can equal that out, but it's done on kind of an ad hoc basis. Cause the, the thing about this to remember is that these, uh, these projects are supporting entire communities. So it's not like people want to treat them like they're just commercial transactions. And that, that's not the case. You've got, you know, they, they work by, 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 by helping communities develop sustainable livelihoods. And even if you look, when you, if you look at any, into any project, even if, if, it, you know, later on people say, oh, maybe, maybe there was, uh, you know, maybe in hindsight, uh, you know, the, the, the threats weren't as great as we thought, they've still generated incredible results. And people in the communities are still counting on that. So you can't, you can't uh, just shortchange them because the outer world changed a little bit. And, and the other thing is the outer world can change back. This is what we saw in Brazil was you saw deforestation rates dropping and then rising again when Bolsonaro came in. And who knows what's going to happen now that Lula's back. Hopefully, you know, I, I'm assuming he'll, 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 you know, make improvements, but now he has the added tool of being able to use jurisdictional crediting. You know, you could argue that if Lula had, if Lula had the ability to earn carbon finance for the reductions he made back when he made them, maybe he would never have been removed from office in the first place. I kind of went in a different direction there, though. Sorry about that. I, um, did I answer the question, or did I? Yeah. Did well, I, you you, I, you were so, you know I was I was asking. If and when it might make sense to include uncertainty yeah. as an element yeah, to I, add to the buffer pool, and you said, you know, um, above your pay grade. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Because I remember, I remember, yeah. yeah just because remember, my background is I was a journalist covering this, uh, uh, and I joined Vera just uh, almost a year ago, 
And um, unfortunately, when you know, I came in with the objective of dealing with this um, communi- this communication and education gap, which I think is the real problem we're having. They they have not really taken the time to explain the way the processes currently work. And then from the day I came in, every time I'd open my inbox, I had 20 questions from reporters, mostly about projects that launched 10 years ago. So it's, it's almost like everyone's looking at what happened in the past. And um, I, I just haven't had time to get up to speed on all of the different proposals for, for the new ways of going forward, which we are changing, by the way. We're beefing up our communication system tremendously. So, so I have two, I, I have sort of two other questions. One mm-hmm. question is what's at stake, right? If, if there's mis- misapprehension, um, maybe even intentionally undermining confidence in a system mm-hmm. that is working, um, mm-hmm. what's at stake if people lose confidence at, <clears throat> in Vera or maybe in carbon credits more broadly? Like what happens? How does that diminish our ability to meet climate goals? Or, you know, like what are the alternatives, I guess? I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Like I'm sure you're clearly you're passionate and probably people at Vera and most of us like in this space are passionate and have this idea like we need to make change we need to finance projects we need to conserve forests we need to take other climate actions you know what's the what's the game here what's at stake if if this goes poorly yeah i think you 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 answered it there uh you know so many i don't have the number off the top of my head um but you know the the amount of forest being protected through through carbon finance is, is massive, and it's not just being protective; it's being the the forest economy is being transformed. Most red plus projects are designed not just to provide a kind of um, you know let let's let's pay this forever to keep the forests intact, but let's help these communities transition to where they're earning money by managing their forests sustainably. And if that if that uh, if that if, if we pull the carpet out after I mean people have, have signed on for thirty year projects and if we if we if, if that money doesn't come in you know it's we could see huge reversals of of the of the progress made you know we you could see projects you know faltering or not expanding and and I mean this is you know the biggest problem of the last ten years people keep talking about like like these project developers are making a fortune they're not. I mean, these guys were barely getting by. They were robbing Peter to pay Paul for 10 years and finally getting above water as people started to pay attention to this. And that's one reason we haven't had the bandwidth to communicate is everybody, what I've been, my favorite saying has been everybody who knows what's going on has their noses to the grindstone and everyone who doesn't has their mouths to the megaphone. And that's the big problem that that we have. And if, if we see that support disappear, we could lose a lot of the progress we've made um you know fortunately what we're from what i'm hearing anecdotally is that while prices for some of these like the ngo might be might be floundering the the actual demand for individual projects is high it seems like it's almost like what happens in the u.s senate or the congress where people you know people are like oh we don't trust congress but we love our congressmen <laughs> you know there are people when they know the story of an individual project and they can read it they go yeah okay this makes perfect sense they're sticking with it and I think as people understand the way the system works, we, we should be able to, to get through this. But I think the real, the real thing, too, is that we're at this inflection point right now where everything that happened in the last 10 years, all the lessons of the last 10 years, everything is being, is being harvested and adjusted into, into new approaches where, you know, we, we, you know, using things like, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know we, we, the risk mapping that we're implementing, there's groups now that you know one of the problems one of the problems with, with, that I had with that we all had I think with the the um, the, the Guardian and the site is they were looking at um, synthetic control modeling which is it's it's an approach that is valid but it's very hard to do in Red Plus because the local drivers are so site specific but with a lot of the new methodologies and digitization of existing methodologies being proposed there are there are is there are there is in theory 
a possibility of really, really ramping up, um, you know, digitizing methodologies, expanding carbon projects uh, at, and reducing costs because the cost of verifying is just massive. You, I mean, up until a couple of years ago, it wasn't really possible to do this digitally. And now it, it, it's getting there. So we're, we're on the cusp of really being able to ramp this up in a way where you, have, you can have standardization where standardization is possible, uh, localization where it's necessary, and m more real-time transparency uh, that is real, unlike the you know, Global Forest Watch, which is a great initiative, but WWI, WRI and Hansen himself have been adamant about saying people should not use Global Forest Watch to evaluate the, the efficacy of a red project. Well, the, there is the next generation of digital MRV will make, will make all of these processes uh, you know, more transparent. And again, I think, I think Vera has been as transparent as it possibly can be. But the technology is going to make it even easier to be transparent. So I think we're in, and at the same time, as prices go up, and this is the big issue, Jonah Bush has done a lot of research into this. Up until this point, most of the red projects are done by groups that really, they're, they're, they're groups that would happily work nonprofit if they could get to scale. Um, and a lot of them are still nonprofit, even in, in, the, um, in the red space. But they've been unable through philanthropy to implement the changes they want. These are, so these are people whose hearts are, are in it already. But as, we, as, as prices go up, you can start to re get to people who are maybe a little more profit-oriented. You can start to get into situations where you can have red plus covering opportunity costs so, you, know, so you can get into higher hanging fruit. You know, the low-hanging fruit is what you had to go for, for first, but higher hanging fruit to expand to where you really, really, really getting bigger results at scale, at jurisdictional levels. And if, if people don't understand how this works, you know, they're not going to back it. So that, that I think is a big threat is not just what we've had so far, but the next step, which where we have to scale up dramatically could, could be endangered. I, I'm, I, I'm optimistic that it won't be because I do think the biggest problem here has been a failure to communicate. And I also think that uh, the way the way narrative works in, in journalism, you know, there's kind of like the pendulum swings, you know, right now, you know, everyone's kind of going, oh, what, you know, these things, you know, people who don't understand them are coming in and looking at them <clears throat> with suspicion. I'm seeing it as I talk to reporters who are new, as they start to dig in and look at the method, they go, they, you see the lights going on, you see them kind of going, okay, I get it now. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm pretty excited, but I do think we can't be complacent. We really have to make sure we're telling the story accurately uh, and, and clearly and simply. Um, great. And my, my last question is kind of forward looking, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, this is embedded in, in what you were just saying around digital MRV technology um, you know, improving just just a whole suite of technological tools mm -hmm. that can probably positively. I mean, I'm a big believer they can pretty radically mm -hmm. transform the marketplace. I'm curious, you know, what are you seeing that's giving you um, optimism, and what are you seeing coming down the the pike on that front that really, um, you know, that you really think is is going to transform both the discourse, like how people make sense of this complex, um, of the complexity, and also just like uh -huh. maybe simplify some of the complexity, makes it faster, makes it more clear. Mm -hmm. A couple of initiatives that have already been, been, um, been announced. Um, I think, you know, Vera has already announced its digital MRV. A program where it's working with a lot of different technology providers. I think the only one that's been announced so far is Pachama, but there are others that have that have approached us. And you know, a lot of people will approach and they'll say, "Let's kick it around a bit. We don't want to go public because if it doesn't work out, we don't want to have to, you know, walk back from something that that we've already announced." Um, but the 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 fact that that uh, that groups like Pachama are coming up with really sophisticated modeling. That does incorporate the new digital, the new, the, the newest advances in remote sensing. The fact that the the Bezos Foundation, 
El Bezos Fund put a lot of work into WRI's efforts, which will then help to ramp up the ability to see in real time what's happening on these ground. Those are the, the issues that are already out there. And I think what, what gets me personally excited, and this is where I can't, I can't go into a whole lot of detail, but when this whole thing started with The Guardian, I was, you know, I, we, Vera has been looking at things like, you know, at, at um, synthetic controls and uh, counterfactual pixels and these sort of modeling approaches that The Guardian relied on. In fact, these methodologies are already embedded in some of the method, or these, are, these tools are embedded in some of the methodologies that Vera uses for things like uh, improved forest management, afforestation, reforestation. You know, it works because the surrounding, the, the drivers are simpler. In both of those cases, you have, you have commoditized or standardized interventions happening in a more homogenous landscape. In um, what, what's, as, as the, this article came out, I, I just got curious about what, what people are looking at in terms of using synthetic controls and counterfactual pixels for red plus where the local drivers are so uh, specific and i spoke to a lot of technologists in this area who have who just shared on a kind of off the record basis some of their their findings and they're convinced that they've cracked the code they're convinced that 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 the ability to use tools that they, they can actually model in, in a much in a, in, a, in a lower cost way and even a more accurate way, what the what the drivers of deforestation are uh, locally, and what that that leads us to a, a situation where the science could get ahead of the the commercialization. I mean, I think that the the limit that we'll always face is going to be that you have to create enough certainty for people to be willing to put money in. You have to be willing to say, okay, you know. If you come in, I mentioned it at the start of the, of the discussion, if you come in and you say, you know, the company wants to, if you want them to commit, you know, to in, implementing really complicated processes and you say, okay, but after two years, if, if, if everything, if ever if things outside your control change, you, you could, you could, uh, you know, we, we could take this away from you. You're not going to get anything done. So we could pretty soon be in a situation where the technology is such that it's only a matter of getting the, the, finding the, the, the right balance to get the commercial money flowing in. And even there, as the modeling increases, and again, we might never get to the point that we can predict every single, uh, you know, I mean, you, you never will. You, you'll be able to predict the, the, the future at every, every single force, but you can say, okay, systemically, we know that if we do a thousand projects, you know, you're going to have overshoot and undershoot. They will definitely balance out so that you can say that your individual credit you know, had the impact you, you, you know, you, you said it did with, with more precision than we have in the past. I think in the past, you know, we, we've mostly said you're probably going to have a bigger input impact than you're paying for. Um, now it'll be a more precise impact, which then, then makes it easier for the project developers themselves to more accurately allocate resources because they're not over, you know, they're, they're not, they don't have to put in all these uncertainty buffers. So I think, I think that that's in a nutshell what I'm what I'm seeing is is just that the uh, you know I had Sasan Sachi I think a lot of people probably know on the show recently talking about uh, his on my podcast talking about the the mass the, the amazing uh, advancements of the last few years and the ability to the, the 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 ability to see much more precisely what's happening on the ground but the real advancement is the ability to map all these local drivers of deforestation. You, you'll still need you'll still need people going out and interviewing people because you know, it is it's it's humans who cause the change, and you need to know what's happening in the minds of the humans who are in the forest. That we'll, we'll never get beyond that uh, as far the as far as I can tell. But uh, um, but that you know that's the gist of it right there. There's just so many. It's it, I mean I, I don't I, I guess your readers know, I don't, or your listeners know how it's been done to date with, you know, the, the, the ground, you know, the, the random sampling and everything. And just to be able to go beyond that is huge. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, cool. Well, we're just coming up to the top of the hour here, Steve, and I want to respect your time and, and everybody else. We try to keep it um, just to, to this specific hour. Do you have any last um, 
thoughts or, or reflections that you want to um, leave the leave the audience with? Um, boy, <laughs> so many. <laughs> People always it's hard to get me to to shut up once we get going. I think yeah, we didn't really talk about the the issue that you asked me to talk about the the, the reporting, but I think we touched on the, the important things, which are what's really happening. And, um, you know, I think the, 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 the biggest challenge we have right now is communicating this. And that's what I hope, that's what my job is supposed to be. So it's not, it's the technology guys, the, method, the, method, the, the technologists and the methodologists and everybody else have done their job really well. So I think we just need to make sure we're telling the story right. And not, you know, not 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 being Pollyanna-ish, not trying to say we solve everything, but uh, to point out what the what works, what doesn't, and how we allow for the uncertainty. And uh, what's the name of your podcast? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's called Bionic Bionic Planet. Planet. Like the Bionic Man, but it's, yeah, the idea that the idea being that we, you know, we we live on a managed planet, and uh, we don't want to have to end up on an engineered planet, but nature but nature and nature-based solutions for the climate challenge awesome well um hopefully folks can go check that out and i really appreciate you taking the time to come and, and hang and just dig in a little bit um on you know baselining and what Vera, where vera is going next and uh yeah i think I, I learned a lot i hope everybody else did as well and um yeah look forward to uh j- jamming with you more in the future and and seeing where Vera and Regen Network can help um, really make that bionic planet regenerative. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the invite. It's uh, it's unusual. I'm usually the one a- asking the questions. It's kind of interesting to be the one doing the blabbing. And I think you you kept me on. I hope you kept me from rambling too much. <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> I think so. I think it was. Okay. I think it was. I think it was pretty useful, um, at least from my perspective. So, um, yeah, great. Thank you. Right on. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you, Steve, uh, for joining us. And we'll see you next week, next Thursday, 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern.